I'm Chad Main, the founder of legal services company Precipient, and this is Technically Legal, a podcast about legal technology, legal innovation, and the impact tech is having on the law. In today's episode, I talked to Alex Kelly. He's the co-founder and CEO of Bright Flag, which is an AI-powered legal operations platform. If you work at a law firm or a company like the one I work for that provides legal services to corporate clients, there's a good chance they use legal management and billing software that service providers can access to upload their bills so they can be paid. From the upload of bills, this software collects a bunch of data points like how many people are working on any given project, what tasks they're working on, how much time they're spending on those tasks, and a bunch of data like that. Companies that use these legal billing and matter management software are putting that data to use to try to get a handle on what they're spending on legal matters, how that money's being spent, and using that data to create legal budgets. Our guest today is Alex Kelly. He's one of the founders of Bright Flag, which is an AI-powered legal operations platform that helps legal teams get a handle on their legal spend and provides insight into their legal operations as a whole. By collecting this billing information, Bright Flag provides insight and data to its users about how legal work is being resourced, which can then be used to inform procurement decisions, can also help figure out which law firms and vendors should be added to their panels, and also helps legal operations get creative about legal pricing models. As we will hear, software like Bright Flag provides a central record-keeping system to help create accurate financial reporting so that legal departments can be more data-driven about how they do their work and more efficient in how they manage their relationships with their legal service providers. It's kind of interesting that Alex ended up co-founding Bright Flag because he never worked in-house and actually spent seven years on the other side of the table at one of Ireland's premier law firms representing financial institutions. I guess it's not that surprising that Alex is a lawyer turned entrepreneur when you find out that both his dad and stepmom are lawyers and his mother's family started one of Ireland's preeminent bespoke carpet manufacturing companies. I think my dad being a lawyer definitely had an influence on my decision to study law in college and ultimately qualify as a lawyer, work as a corporate lawyer. What I saw was he he had built a good business. He was in a kind of a boutique corporate firm running it here in Dublin, had built a good business, enjoyed the work that he was doing and had done well out of it. And certainly I think he probably saw certain characteristics in me that thought I might be well suited to it. And I would say he kind of encouraged it, but didn't kind of force the issue too strongly. I met my stepmother when I had just finished college and uh, was starting to think about which law firm to join, what areas to practice. And she's always been an incredible sounding board for me in giving great advice um, around my career generally and and certainly specifically uh, at that kind of really important stage where I was kind of thinking about how I wanted to kind of take that first step and and kind of develop as a young lawyer and uh, and and to this day still is a is a great sounding board both of them for me on career advice. So even though your your dad didn't push and your stepmom didn't push, were they excited that you chose the legal path? I think they were. I think I think they both realized that it is a difficult path. Working in a large firm, <laughs> uh, as you know, is it can be incredibly rewarding. Great career development great opportunities to learn, but it is it is also a, a difficult uh, career path and probably one that is only becoming more difficult over time. And um, so I think they were both excited for me. I think the most important thing for them has always been, are you happy what you're doing? Are you enjoying it? Are you rewarded by it? And I do remember there was a point in time when I'd been practicing for about seven years as a corporate lawyer, progressing really well in the firm that I was working in and, and getting great experience and had a great mentor there that I worked really closely with and, and learned a huge amount from. But it was actually my stepmother who kind of first raised the question with me, are you are you really enjoying this? Is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? And I think if she hadn't asked that question, I, I might still be there. Right. I think I saw somewhere that she was the one that kind of encouraged you to pursue entrepreneurship. Yeah. And she wasn't giving any kind of specific advice about you should do go and start a <laughs> a legal technology company or, or join one. Uh, it was more related to her seeing that I was, I was doing really well as a corporate lawyer, progressing well, uh, but maybe not loving it and, and as passionate about it as the way she was and wondering, did I want to kind of fully commit to that career path and the kind of partner trajectory and everything that goes with that. Or I was at that point in my life where I had gotten great experience, but I was still in my late 20s, didn't have a a kind of a a mortgage and a wife and kids to support and and had that opportunity maybe to take what was a pretty significant risk at the time and in uh, joining Ian, uh, Ian Nolan, our CEO, and my co-founder who had had just started Bright Flag, 
but it was definitely her kind of asking that question that that kind of started the journey where I, I started to think about what I wanted to do. And something I'd always experienced was more of an interest in the kind of the business of law and was just obviously on the front line in seeing the way in which law firms manage those relationships with large corporate clients the and the fact that the hourly rate at that point in time back in 2014 was still the way in which the vast majority of work was done that that remains the case today but seeing that it was causing a lack of visibility a lack of kind of data-driven decision making both for corporate legal departments and law firms in understanding how best to resource work uh, putting in place more efficient pricing and I suppose I had developed a level of domain understanding of, of the business of law and the kind of the problem that we ultimately look to solve with Bright Flag uh, that has been incredibly useful in the business that we've built. So I certainly never regret the decision to, to study law, practice law, hugely grateful for the, the incredible training that I got, the mentors that I had, the, the kind of exposure that I got while working in a firm. Uh, because it probably was the platform to go on and do a, w- what I've done since with, with the enterprise flag. But look at your background. Your the first part of your legal career was at a big law firm doing work, legal work for financial institutions. So the, th- the thing I'm, I'm curious about is why did you care? Like you're coming from a law firm, so what was it about the way billing is done here that you cared and wanted to come over to? not the corporate side per se, but create a tool that is used by corporate consumers of legal services to kind of get a handle on on their bills. Yeah, I think there was probably always an entrepreneur buried in there somewhere where I saw this opportunity where this is a, a really large problem in the legal industry. And there was the opportunity to develop a platform and a product that could improve the relationship between corporate legal departments and law firms. I will always care deeply about the relationship I had with my clients. And I think the firm I worked in had a very client-centric ethos in, in being incredibly responsive, incredibly commercial and how it worked with its clients. And I just saw that there was this opportunity that existed for large global organizations with ever-increasing legal budgets, legal departments, complexity in their global operations, where the legal industry generally, legal departments specifically, had probably lagged behind in the adoption of, of technology. This opportunity existed and certainly our kind of our initial starting point using machine learning language analysis technology to analyze a pre-existing data set, essentially, which was the way law firms already build their corporate clients, charging by the hour, providing long narrative time entries, uh, this unstructured data set that, that that already existed. There was no major change in behavior needed to start to add value for corporate legal teams. Um, so the machine learning, classifying that data, providing greater visibility, enabling more effective cost control, driving more automation, enabling kind of data-driven decision-making in relationships with law firms, um, that that was really compelling. And I could just see the value it was going to provide. And, and in the earliest days of Bride Flag, our first, our first customers, we could just see it. It was there the minute they started to use the product, uh, the initial product we launched, which was essentially an invoice and analytics tool. It was delivering great insights and was definitely something that was facilitating the type of relationship I wish I kind of was able to have to some extent with my corporate clients, which was more data driven, uh, more a little bit more objective and and um, and probably uh, in everybody's interest, the law firms as much as the legal departments. What is the origin story? It was Ian Nolan, our CEO, uh, my co-founder, who had that light bulb. He was working in a legal technology company, building software for law firms. And probably appreciating the same issue that that I was experiencing working in a law firm, which is there's a fair amount of inefficiency in how things were were operating. But the catalyst for change was likely to come from the corporate legal departments more than the law firms uh, in the short term, because the way in which the hourly rate works, the way in which time gets billed was not as efficient as it could be. So Ian had this initial idea of building a tool that uses AI machine learning to read invoicing data and provide insight and drive more effective cost control and more automation. And I was lucky enough to to get to know him very early in in the kind of first few months of him having that idea. We spent a few months getting to know each other better. How did he find you? I found him. There was, uh, yeah, he he was involved in an initial accelerator program and uh, 
there was a little bit of press in in Dublin where he'd started the business around that. And I reached out to him on LinkedIn and, and we uh, we started meeting for coffees, getting to know each other, getting to know our respective views on on the opportunity, how you go about solving the problem. And I think we had just this kind of, first of all, great chemistry, probably complementary skill sets as well in terms of uh, him coming from more of a, a technical background, me coming directly from the legal domain and just having a, a great alignment about how we could go about solving this problem. And yeah, I suppose the rest is kind of history to some extent. Uh, nearly nine years later, here we are. Your first customer, how'd you get your first customer? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, our first customer was the subsidiary of a large bank, and uh, we were very lucky in that. I think one of their senior legal leaders was familiar with the kind of the startup scene in Ireland, was experiencing a real a real challenge around cost control and management of the relationship with outside uh, counsel. And so saw the value in what we were doing. We did an initial proof of concept with them, which was incredibly successful in demonstrating the effectiveness of the platform and driving cost control, delivering an ROI. And uh, I think we were very fortunate to have a champion who had a real pain point that we were able to solve, but also was was uh, willing to kind of work with founders and an early stage company and have a real impact on our, our product. And, and they did. So it was... Probably a combination of, of hustle as founders and getting out there and doing the early selling ourselves and engaging within the ecosystem. And I think that's something we've always found is I think uh, the legal ecosystem, the legal operations community, I think uh, there are so many people within it who are looking to find ways to do things more efficiently, looking to innovate. And uh, we were lucky to kind of the, our early customers were huge parts in the, the subsequent success that we've had. When we come back. Alex explains exactly what Bright Flag does, how it works, and how it provides insight about legal work that enabled one company to automate 60% of its legal bill analysis, and it helped another company figure out that they should be doing some legal work in-house rather than sending it out. I'm Chad Main, and you're listening to Technically Legal. This podcast is brought to you by Percipient, a legal services company powered by technology. Percipient helps legal teams tackle legal operations, electronic document review, and process automation. Recipient services include managed document review, subpoena compliance, cyber incident response, and also helps legal teams provide clients with process-driven legal support. To learn more, visit percipient.co. Percipient. Legal services powered by technology. Okay, let's get back to my conversation with Alex Kelly. We're going to let him fill us in on how Bright Flag actually works and how some of Bright Flag's customers have used the data gathered by the app to improve their legal operations. So it starts with the process, as I understand that Bright Flag starts with law firms upload their bills or billing info to Bright Flag. The software uses natural language processing to figure out what the tasks were and what the lawyers were doing. And then from there, it shoots it over to a little AI, a little machine learning, and does the analysis of the information and then provides the insights. Is that a good overview of how it works? Yeah, correct. That's one, one aspect of what the platform is doing now is managing kind of invoice analysis, review and approval for corporate legal departments. Law firms submit an invoice. As you said, the machine learning reads and understands the invoice, classifies it. So for the individual within the legal department reviewing the invoice, they now have insights through Bright Flag about how long was spent drafting a particular document or uh, attending meetings on a particular transaction, whatever the activities may be, classifying all of that data, applying rules, identifying inefficiencies, billing guideline violations, applying any budgets that exist on the matter. And so providing a much greater degree of insight around how the work is being resourced, automating all of the kind of uh, cost controls that, that exist, and then also aggregating all of that data. So the analysis that's done on an individual invoice is all aggregating up to the overall matter and then to the overall picture that the legal department has about how its work is being resourced uh, in a particular region, in a particular practice area with one law firm versus another. And that data is being used uh, to inform panel management, procurement decisions, decisions around trying to move work to kind of fix pricing models. And uh, as I said, that is kind of one aspect of what the platform is doing. That the, in addition to that, it's it's acting as that kind of central system of record, providing all of the kind of financial reporting the legal department needs, 
automating budgeting processes, accruals processes, enabling them to kind of store their tasks and documents in one centralized place um, and effectively just become more data driven, more efficient in how they manage those relationships with law firms, how they actually do their work, how they manage their relationships with, uh, with the finance department. And it also predict. It'll predict, kind of forecast what it thinks your spend will be. Correct. Yeah. One of the really, uh, really exciting things we launched in the last few years is a tool which enables departmental budgeting and, and gives an AI powered forecast around what your overall uh, spend for a particular practice area, uh, region, uh, department is going to be based on an analysis of the data. So I think underpinning our success here at BrightFlag has really been a combination of building that AI powered technology. Uh, being incredibly customer focused and, and our team and particularly our customer success team really acting as a kind of a trusted guide for our our customers in not just providing them with data, but helping them interpret that data, identify insights and opportunities to kind of improve their operations. Um, and I think that's, that's really been at, at the heart of our success as much as building a great product has been really focusing on kind of partnering with our customers and on their kind of maturity journey as they, they improve their operations. So let's look under the hood a little bit. You mentioned billing guidelines. It's one thing it looks for violations of, and it looks for inefficiencies generally. How does that work? The law firm feeds in that information and then the software takes a look and sees you know, anything that's, that's not jibing with it. So best practice we would see in the industry now is that corporate legal departments should have a set of billing guidelines in place with all of the law firms and legal service providers that they work with. And there are fairly kind of well-defined industry right. standards around what you should or shouldn't be paying for. So the system will essentially automate all of those billing guidelines that you have in place. So the first thing that the system will do is analyze the invoices, and then it will apply those billing guidelines and highlight any violations, any inefficiencies, and ensure that law firms are adhering to them. Um, so that includes agreed hourly rates, ensuring things that you've agreed won't be charged for or not charged for, like prohibited disbursements, but also more granular analysis around how many lawyers are attending on a particular call or meeting. Or How does it know? How does it know four people are on a call? Yeah, so that is uh, at the heart of our kind of patented machine learning. Part of what the, the system is doing is not just classifying the, the tasks that have been carried out, such as working on a motion or working on a particular agreement, but also the activity. So the system will actually classify how much time is being spent on internal communications within the law firm, how, time, how much time is being spent communicating with external parties. So that essentially is the, the power of our kind of patented AI is without any training needed for an individual customer, the system will automatically provide that level of insight. So I would say that that's the kind of billing guideline adherence is one part of the puzzle. I think what's important is a kind of broader cost control program for, for legal departments. So that means having effective budgeting processes in place, having good accruals processes in place where you're getting accurate forecasting on your future legal spend, billing guideline adherence. Our ultimate vision is your law firm should have real clarity about your billing guidelines. They should be adhering to them. Uh, the system is, is enabling that level of oversight and giving you visibility over that. But really, to the greatest extent possible, you, you want to automate that process and not have either your internal team members in the legal department or law firms having to kind of go back and forth on individual invoices. What if a company has something unique in their billing guidelines? To, to your point, most are the same. Like, you know, they can bill for this, can't bill for that, can't have five people on the call. But what if there's something unique in their guidelines? How does the software handle that? Essentially, the what we call the rules engine that 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 implements the billing guidelines is effectively fully configurable. So, any of these kind of unique rules that that a legal department puts in place can be configured within the engine because of the way the machine learning is working. Because it is classifying every task, every activity, every unit of time, uh, you essentially can add any any rule on top of that to highlight violations or inefficiencies. You mentioned the insight that comes that starts with these bills, but then you know the insight comes from all the the data gathered. On a, another podcast I was listening to that you were that you were the guest on, uh, you mentioned that I, th I believe it was an insurance company has automated sixty percent of their bill analysis. How they do that? Yeah, so it's using the technology essentially. So ensuring that your billing guidelines have been configured through the platform. Once that's been achieved, what they're doing on in particular with their kind of higher volume, lower value invoices is the system will automatically read and understand the invoice. 
It will automatically approve it if there's no violations of budget arrangements, of hourly rates, of the billing guidelines, and automatically send it to finance without any need for any, any human intervention. If there is a, a violation, the system can automatically route that back to the law firm to correct. Um, so, so that's how they're achieving it, is essentially using that technology, that uh, AI-powered invoice review technology, to kind of define characteristics like invoices under $10,000. If there are no violations, that invoice can be automatically approved. So that's the kind of longer term vision for many of our customers is kind of automating the kind of higher volume, lower complexity invoice analysis. There may always be a level of oversight wanted over like your your kind of very large litigation or corporate invoices where you've got team members working closely with the with the law firm month to month um, and the system is kind of giving huge context about how the work's getting resourced to kind of drive a lot more insight and, and make it a much quicker process to manage those larger invoices as well and to that point another benefit one of your customers received is there's a logistics company they took a look at one of their litigation workflows and figured out they could staff it better and save some money. How did they use the tool to figure that out? I think if I was a general counsel, a legal operations professional, looking at a cost control strategy, which obviously in the current macro level environment is really important. I think the first thing you need is visibility. So you need to understand at the highest level, how much am I spending with each law firm, within each region, by reference to each practice area. And once you start to understand that, then you can start to make data-driven decisions about how to make it more efficient. So in the in the case of that logistics company, they developed a very clear picture of how their litigation work, a particular area of litigation work, was getting resourced by their law firms. And they identified that there was a pretty expensive resource within law firms um, managing a certain phase of the litigation. And they were able to kind of build the business case to hire an internal team to insource that that phase of the work at a fraction of the cost. And that is the power, I think, of having visibility and having a clear picture of, of what's happening today, of how much is being spent. Uh, because once you understand that, then you can start to see the opportunities to do the work in a more efficient way. So I think that is is really, really important. And I think the most effective relationships I've seen between our clients and their law firms are collaborative ones where there is that trust and there's that understanding that they're moving towards more data-driven relationships where the data is being shared openly and um, law firms are being given the right type of work, the right type of fee arrangements are being put in place, that the law firms are understanding the importance of adhering to the arrangements around financial reporting and accruals or budgeting. Uh, they're adhering to the billing guidelines. They're providing great quality legal advice. And those law firms tend to kind of really benefit from that in in getting more work sent their way and building closer relationships with uh, clients. So I think for many of our clients, it isn't the question of trying to just figure out how to insource more work or it's not about nickel and diming law firms on individual charges. It is overall a more data-driven approach, which means greater predictability on spend, the right firms doing the right type of work, and everybody understanding the guardrails of that in terms of the, the KPIs that are going to get tracked. And to that point, we all know the economy worldwide is kind of dicey right now. It's a wild card. How would you suggest corporate legal departments and their lawyers, the insight they're getting from Bright Flag to kind of figure out how to better navigate the uncertainty in the economy right now? Yeah, it's a great question. So as you know, I, we, I have a podcast myself where I speak to legal operations leaders. In-house and, outliers. Uh, in-house outliers. In, in-house outliers. Yeah. And, and that's been a, a, a great learning experience for me, having these conversations with the kind of the pioneers in the legal operations space. And I think the first thing to say is that driving change, driving any strategy, and in this case, a more effective kind of cost control strategy for your legal department, given the current environment we find, find ourselves in. The first thing to get right is the kind of the people and the buy-in to that strategy. So having the buy-in of the general counsel and legal leadership, that this is a priority, um, number one, and this is this is how we're going to use technology to drive a different type of relationship with our firms. That is the, the most important thing. The technology is secondary to that. Once you have that buy-in, I think there are a whole multitude of kind of cost control strategies you can implement using the technology. 
it tends to be a journey that our clients go on. And for many, the kind of starting point, as I said, is you need centralized visibility. You need to understand how much you're spending with who. Uh, you need better predictability. So you need to have more accurate forecasts on your on your future spend. And I think in parallel with that, you should start putting in place more effective cost control mechanisms like a matter budgeting process where budgets must get agreed at the start of a matter and then they get tracked through the tool over time. That's still surprising how it is not widespread in the industry, that behavior of of having a conversation up front with your firm, agreeing the budget, tracking to it, understanding that scope can change, but, but putting in place that control and that behavior can be really effective in driving a cost control strategy. Obviously, putting in place a set of billing guidelines and automating the the application of those drives much more efficient resourcing by your firms. And then I think in the longer term, you can start to use the data out of the platform to make decisions around consolidating work with one law firm versus the other, putting in place things like volume trade discounts where you, you get a greater discount if you give more work to a particular firm, transitioning more work to kind of fixed pricing models and giving you greater predictability and control over that. As you highlighted, identifying opportunities to kind of build a business case for more internal resourcing and reducing external dependencies. So there is really a kind of body work that can be done once you have the number one, the internal motivation and buy in. And number two, you then you then enable the team to go and execute on these different cost control initiatives. And and I think the most important point is it does not have to be a kind of an adversarial context with your firms. I think they will if you communicate effectively with them, they'll buy into what you're trying to do. Speaking your podcast, what's the one thing, what you've learned doing a podcast? The one thing I've learned from the podcast is the level of creativity and the lack of defined career path that exists for these legal operations professionals that are really transforming the legal industry. Um, So I think I've spoken to over 40 of them on the podcast at this stage, and they come from a variety of different backgrounds. Some started life as as professional dancers, as musicians, as sports broadcasters. Many worked in finance or management consulting. Uh, some were lawyers, some were paralegals, some worked in, in law firms and pricing roles. But all of them have kind of found their way into this new role, legal operations, and they're making a massive impact both within their, their legal departments on legal service delivery, but also within the wider industry, because I really do think the legal departments are the catalyst for change. And I think it's, it's just int- interesting to see that it is this new function that didn't exist a decade ago that is having a huge impact and the individuals within it are, are coming from such a varying areas of experience. But I think when they have that creativity, when they have that kind of growth mindset, they can they can have a massive impact on the success of their organization. Yeah, I agree that changes for the most part or a good chunk of it substantively has to come from the legal department. I, I agree 100%. And there's sometimes a disconnect between legal departments and their law firms as change isn't happening. I agree. I agree with that. Alex, thanks for your time today. If people want to learn more about you or find your podcast, where do you send them? Best place to find more about Bright Flag is brightflag.com. Uh, you can find a link to the podcast in House Outliers on there and certainly learn more about the legal operations movement and the Bright Flag platform. Okay, that's a wrap for today's episode. As always, we really appreciate you listening. If you want to subscribe, you can find us on most major podcast platforms like Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, etc. Also, if you like us enough, I hope you leave us a favorable review. Thanks again for listening. Until next time, this has been Technically Legal.